Welcome to Auditory Precision. Uh, today we're going to get a little detailed. We're going to talk about auditory brain response and autoacoustic admissions, which will uh, lead us into some auditory processing disorder. And when we're talking about ABR testing, I'm going to keep it in the pediatric realm. And what we're dealing with is now a child who has been just born. And what we're going to utilize is electrodes like an EKG. And I'm going to place them in specific spots. I'm going to have a grounding electrode placed on the forehead, an active electrode placed on top of the head, and uh, two negative reference electrodes that will be placed on both mastoid uh, process. Now, what will take place is I will put in a certain amount of decibels to make sure that the sound leaving the cochlea, so retrocochlear, will go up the brainstem to the auditory cortex. And this wave is what I want to get. Now, this wave is the stations that it will pass before it reaches the auditory cortex. And this should get presented to us at about 15 decibels. Now, a lot of times I will have a dBNHL for normal hearing level and a dBEHL for estimated. Now, obviously, if we're not dealing with a computer programming, usually SPL is, is used with HL. And if I'm bringing in about 25 decibels of normal hearing level, it does end up getting estimated to about 15, which is normal. In my son's case, uh, he was presented at 55 dB NHL, estimated at about 35, which gave him a mild to moderate hearing loss. This is quite confusing because this will change depending on what system that you use. Now, when talking about an autoacoustic emission, they will do this along with the ABR test, and it's done with a probe mic, and I go from very low frequencies to very high frequencies, and when the frequencies are presented at a certain decibel, I should be able to get noise emitted from the outer hair cells. When stimulated, these will actually make a noise. And so let's say at 500 hertz, I will hear um, signal getting placed back from the outer hair cells, and so it passes at 500. But say at 750, I don't get a sound back. That would be a fail. So OAE is uh, a pass or fail test, um, not as sensitive as the ABR, but they are usually done together. So let's go over this wave in more detailed fashion, which will bring us to some auditory processing disorders. So here, we're going to go over the waves, where it passes through, and what it's good for. Now, whether it's a child or an elderly patient, if we have any damage in this pathway, this is called an auditory processing disorder or central hearing loss, and we'll touch a little bit on that. When the sound passes through the cochlea and it goes to the auditory nerve, that's wave one. Um, from wave one, I will reach the cochlear nucleus, which is wave two, and this helps with contrast of sound. As um, I get up to the superior olivary complex, we should know here that obviously we're dealing with localization. This is also where ipsilateral and contralateral information goes back and forth. And uh, this is also where binaural fusion takes place. So I know to look to the left because sound hit the left ear before it hits the right, but it merges nicely in the superior olivary complex, which is wave three. From there, moving up, I'm going to go through a bundle of nerves called the lateral lamiscus. And this helps with amplitude of sound, which is wave four. I will then come up to the inferior colliculus, which is a pretty amazing station here. This is wave five. This is usually as far as our ABR wave goes because after this, the waves are harder to follow. But here, I'm also being helped with localization of sound like done at the superior olivary complex. But the other thing that's taking place here is I enhance amplitude and I also do something called backwards masking. Now, with the brain, backwards masking can take a sound uh, or a stimulus that you're paying attention to and basically amplify it to mask out other sounds, you know. Um, 
So this is a wild phenomenon that takes place only in the inferior colliculus, and this is wave five. From here, I'm going to go up to the medial geniculate, which is now wave six. And uh, here, it's the station between the brainstem and the cortex. So this is my last station. This helps with signal processing. So with processing, if I have an elderly patient that might be slowing down, uh, what will happen is I might get a lag that will create certain sounds to be garbled. And another thing that can take place here is that if my processing slows down, I can have temporal smearing, which is more evident with somebody who's listening to a fast talker. By the time they've figured out what word has been stated, the talker might already be on word three, therefore just getting overlapping information because my processing station has slowed down. This also helps out with um, understanding vowel sounds. And um, as I move out from here, I leave the brainstem and I come into the cortex, which would be uh, wave seven. The auditory cortex is what helps with consonants um, and it also helps with auditory space. Now, auditory space is something that, like in headphones, when you put them on, it sounds like it's coming from the middle of the skull. Uh, this is a phenomenon that the auditory cortex takes place. Uh, this also helps with localization. Now, from here, the signal will go to Warnicke's area, which is right behind the auditory cortex, which is also in the temporal lobe, some in the parietal lobe, but that will basically take the sound that reaches the auditory cortex and read it and understand it. Um, it's not the only area. It will go through the rest of the brain and other areas, but it's all about comprehension and uh, recognition of information. And so if we're having any issues in this, this is what an auditory processing disorder with children, this can... It doesn't lead to a learning disability, but a lot of learning disabilities we do find uh, also ended up having issues here. But kind of to sum it up, that's a little bit of the wave that takes place. So again, the wave from one, two, three, four, five goes from one, two, three, four, five, and then it goes up a little bit higher here. But nonetheless, this is a really fascinating and uh, complex system.